Hello, everyone, and welcome to our filter membrane cleaning webinar. My name is Michelle Christian, and I handle the sales and marketing for international products. Perhaps I've sent you samples or spoken with you about our products. In an effort to save time, please submit your questions during the webinar. You'll find on your screen a field where you can type your questions online. All questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the webinar. I'll begin the webinar with a brief overview of our company. International Products manufactures specialty cleaners and PAD rubber assembly loops. Our manufacturing facility is headquartered in New Jersey with worldwide distribution. Next, we'll have a brief review of what will be discussed. Today's agenda includes global water supply dilemma, industry's challenges, industry's alternatives, general overview of chemical effects on membranes, cleaners, laboratory cleaning trials and their scenarios, conclusions, and questions. Water is our most vital natural resource after air. There's a fixed amount of water on Earth and a significant supply disparity worldwide. Usage varies in the U.S. per person and per country. In the United States, 145 gallons of water is used per day by one individual. Compare that to one gallon of water used per day by one individual in other countries. The need for potable water will continue to escalate and that's due to the increase in world population, the increase in agricultural products, greater energy demands, and changes in lifestyle. There are some industry challenges that, uh, that you may come across. 20% uh, water is used in industry, and there are regulatory requirements that further tie your hands, such as the MARPOL Treaty, the FDA, the USDA, EPA, CFIS, and local, regulatories, local regulations. There are economic pressures, and desalination and water reuse is on the rise. We have some solutions to keep those membranes working. So you do have choices. There's crisis control or preventive maintenance. But is crisis control really sustainable? There's trial and error. And you can also outsource and let another company worry about the problem. You can also partnership with a specialty chemical manufacturer to put together a formula that's uh, conducive to your cleaning your membranes. But there is help. I'll turn the presentation over to our VP of Research, Tom McGuckin. Tom has been with International Products for over 12 years and handles all aspects of research and product development. Thanks, Michelle. I, too, would like to thank everyone for attending our webinar. I hope that we can offer you new ideas for cleaning your membranes and that with the right cleaning protocol, your filtration system will remain effective for a very long time. First, I'd like to cover some basic membrane compatibility and performance factors. Okay, so you have your new membrane right out of the box, and with it is its operating specifications, the, the do's and don'ts of handling membrane, your membrane. Four of the most common factors are chlorine tolerance, temperature, pressure, and pH. Many membranes, especially thin film composites, can't tolerate any chlorine at all. Even concentrations of chlorine less than 1 ppm could be destructive to these membranes. So knowing what's in your water source is critical to the effective functioning of these membranes. Temperature and pressure, very common factors, and exceeding these operating limits also could irreparably harm the membrane. And then pH. You have to avoid the pH extremes. Anything less than 2, and up until a few years ago, greater than 12 were considered extreme. But more recently, the upper limit now with a lot of membranes is greater than 10.5. It seems that some of the newer membranes on the market have a tighter pH tolerance, and this you must be aware of in case you're using very highly alkaline cleaners. Now, what's ironic, to create a very robust and aggressive cleaning solution, a lot of the times you need to push the limits of these factors. 
a high chlorine concentration will disinfect thoroughly. A very hot cleaning solution with a lot of turbulence will clean very effectively. And a pH, and a cleaning solution with uh, either a low pH or a high pH can clean quite effectively. But obviously, if you use this aggressive solution on the membranes, you will quickly destroy them. So middle ground needs to be established. And the last three factors that I like to bring attention to are solvents, cationic surfactants, and low HLB non-ionics. Solvents are chemicals that provide excellent detergency. They clean quickly, they have a high soil load content, and the big drawback with solvents are their compatibility with polymers, not to mention the safety issues. They are known to craze or crack certain polymers, and in particular, ketone solvents have this reputation of doing it very quickly. Cationic surfactants are a special kind of surfactant. They're very popular, particularly in hard surface disinfectants, because cationic surfactants have a dual role. First, they clean, and secondly, they disinfect. They kill bacteria. The way cationic surfactants work is when these surfactants dissolve in water, they actually dissociate into a positive component and a negative component. So, if these are used in membranes, and it would be tempting to because they have the reputation of cleaning and disinfecting, what happens is the positive component will actually have an affinity to the membrane surface because, in general, membrane surfaces are negatively charged. So this cationic portion of the surfactant will literally stick and embed itself into the high surface area of the membrane. And removing it could be quite troublesome. You would need to rinse and rinse and rinse, and then finally you would eventually get it out. Similarly, low HLB non-ionics. Non-ionics are also surfactants. However, when they dissolve in water, they do not associate. And non-ionics can be measured using the HLB scale, and that stands for hydrophobic lipophobic balance. And essentially, it's a scale that tells the formulating chemist how water-soluble the non-ionic is. So, for example, a non-ionic surfactant that has an HLB value of 1 is very oil-soluble. It does not dissolve easily in water. At the other end, an HLB value of, say, 50, that surfactant is very water-soluble, and it has almost no affinity to oil. So a lot of heavy-duty grease and oil-cutting fluids, cleaners, I'm sorry, actually contain low HLB surfactants. And again, it could be tempting to use these as cleaners, but the problem is, since they don't completely dissolve, they could actually foul the membrane further. And once they get into that high surface area membrane surface, it's difficult to get them out. They don't rinse away easily because they have very low water solubility. So typically what must be done is you need to add another surfactant, one maybe with a higher HLB, to remove the oil loving HLB surfactant. Next, I want to talk about fouling at the molecular level. Like I just mentioned, most membrane surfaces have a negative charge associated with them. Soils actually have a hydrophobic attraction to these negatively charged surfaces. And this, this attraction is actually called van der Waal forces. These are interactive forces that occur between molecules. And this is due to electrical distortions when the soil molecules come close to one another. Basically, the, mo the molecules' polarities fluctuate in sync. And what happens is this allows for an ordered uniform lattice to form on the membrane surface. So if you think of an oil molecule as a piece of thread, the thread will lay flat on the membrane surface. Its van der Waal force 
forces then affect the next piece of thread, and that will lay next to the original one, and then so on and so on until the entire surface is covered, and it resembles sort of a patchwork. Then another layer forms, and so on and so and so on, so that essentially you could have hundreds or thousands of these patchwork soils covering the membrane. And to further complicate this, if there's any metals that are present in the soil, such as I'm sorry, such as calcium, magnesium, or iron, they actually have stronger forces associated with them than the Van der Waal forces. And they can actually make the pieces of thread to orient, the, orient themselves perpendicularly to the surface of the membrane. So that now the thread is 90 degrees relative to the membrane surface, and that allows for a much denser coating. So you can fit many more oil molecules because they're oriented perpendicularly, and then once the membrane surface is covered, you, would, you put on another layer and another layer and another layer. And this is called a salt bridge. It's a very difficult soil to remove because you have the cations and the oils in combination that have a fairly strong force with, associated with the membrane surface. And this can occur with a lot of different soils. Natural organic matter, which is basically a collection of, of everything organic, such as oils and fatty acids that, that just collect and foul membranes, proteins, biofilms, the multivalent cations that I've mentioned, polymers, and scale, which are water deposits. All right, so what happens to this, this ordered uniform lattice when you introduce a cleaner? Well, when you introduce a cleaner, you're essentially introducing additional functional groups to the fouling layer. Now, functional groups are specific arrangements of elements within a molecule, and the molecule is the cleaner. So these functional groups have their own charge, and this charge should be stronger than the Van der Waal forces and the salt bridges. So what should happen is the functional groups should create an electrostatic repulsion from the membrane surface. So it actually forces the, the soil to be repulsed from the surface. And then the cleaner molecule also has additional function, functional groups at its other end, and they're hydrophilic in nature so that they are water, very water-soluble. This mechanism is the same for all different types of cleaners. Um, caustics, bleaches, oxidizers, enzymes, surfactants, acids, and keelants are all individual cleaner ingredients, and they all essentially accomplish the same thing, some better than others, depending on the soil. And then when all these, or rather, when these ingredients are combined in a systematic way, then you have formulated mixtures or formulated cleaners. And that's what I'd like to talk about next in a little bit more detail. So what I'd like to talk about are alkaline and acid cleaners. They are certainly the most popular types of cleaners used in membrane systems. Alkaline cleaners generally have a pH greater than 9, and they are very effective against oils, greases, and all their additives. They usually, well, they, they pretty much contain a combination of surfactants and builders. And like I mentioned before, they contain non-ionic surfactants with a very narrow HLB range. Not too low, not too high, but somewhere in the middle. They also contain anionic surfactants. And these surfactants are the opposite of cationic. So in other words, when the anionic surfactants associate in water, it's the negative component of the molecule that is responsible for the detergency and the emulsification of the oils and greases. Now, in order to keep these surfactants working effectively and for a very long time, you need to combine them with another ingredient. And collectively, these are known as builders. Builders improve the detergency of the overall cleaner by improving the water quality. By improving the water quality, they prevent the salt bridges from forming, and they also prevent 
hard water salts from falling out of the cleaner solution. And again, this allows the surfactants to work better and longer. So that's the main purpose of the alkaline cleaners. And because you're combining multiple ingredients, you're also targeting, targeting many different types of soils. The other end of the pH spectrum are acid cleaners. Generally, these are formulated to have a pH lower than 4. And unlike the alkaline cleaners, the acid cleaners are effective against metals such as iron, calcium, magnesium, oxides of those metals, inorganics, and scale, which are, again, hard water deposits. Citric acid is becoming much more prevalent in the membrane cleaning industry because of this green initiative. It's a safe choice of an acid. It's not harmful like sulfuric or hydrochloric. Citric acid is organic in nature. It has excellent compatibility with a lot of membrane polymers. It biodegrades, and it's non-corrosive. And then the added benefit is when you combine citric acid with a surfactant or two, you actually have a fairly robust acid cleaner that has excellent compatibility. Now, another very important ingredient that is used in cleaners is a keelant. And this is also um, a secondary role is a builder, like I mentioned before. Keelants have a unique property in that their main, their main purpose is to improve the water quality. And it does this by literally grabbing and wrapping around metals that are in solution. So the keelant actually traps the metals. It prevents them from forming the salt bridges. And therefore, as a whole, the detergency of the cleaning solution increases. And keelants do exist as both alkaline and acid ingredients. But they do have some liabilities associated with them. For example, once the keelant wraps around metals, that whole system is able to pass through into the permeate. So that's something you need to be aware of. Also, many of the keelants that are available do not biodegrade, and a lot of them, when used as is, are outside the pH limits of the membranes. One keelant in particular is EDTA. It's the workhorse keelant that's in the membrane cleaning industry. EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. And it's a weak acid, and it has very low water solubility. But when it is combined with sodium to form a salt, its pH goes up significantly, and it becomes very water soluble. So therefore, it becomes a very effective keelant in an alkaline cleaner. So again, if you have a chelated metal, you may need to um, break that keelant bond after cleaning. And there's a few different ways to do that. Basically, you can precipitate out the EDTA with an acid. You lower the pH of the solution. The sodium dissociates from the EDTA and the acid forms again and it precipitates out. The metals that were originally chelated can be precipitated out by either oxidation or reduction or increasing the, the pH to form a hydroxide or forming a sulfide. Another unique characteristic with EDTA, EDTA recovery is you can actually displace one metal with another. And by that I mean the EDTA and, and other keelants basically have different chelating strengths depending on the metal. So, for example, if you have, say, cadmium or nickel or chrome that's chelated by EDTA, if you introduce, say, calcium or magnesium, you will displace that heavy metal with the calcium or the magnesium. And then, again, you can work to chelate out the, uh, the, calcium, uh, the cadmium or the chrome, etc. Probably what's the most easiest is to use a proprietary polymer that um, can precipitate everything out. However, you do need to be aware that these polymers um, can fail membranes. Or what is also becoming more prevalent in the market is biodegradable keelants. Now, biodegradable keelants have existed for a very long time, but they could not be compared to the strength of EDTA. Until about a year or so ago, 
derivatives of EDTA are be, started to appear on the market, and they work almost as effectively as EDTA. However, they biodegrade. So this is this is an area where the uh, the biodegradable keelant has a clear advantage over the standard EDTA keelant. Okay, so we talked about the chemical mechanisms of failing and cleaning the membranes. Now, when is, when is the right time to clean? Well, the 10% rule predominates. I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard of it. Basically, if the pressure increases up to 10% or the flux decreases up to 10% or the permeate quality decreases up to 10%, it's time to um, start the cleaning procedure. The pressure and the flux are probably the easiest to measure. They can be done real time. The permeate quality, on the other hand, may be slightly more difficult. There's a few ways to measure the permeate quality. Probably the most thorough way is using either an HPLC or an IC. These instruments have the ability to both identify and quantitate the impurities that are in the permeate. So, for example, if you look at the chart on the right, it's a typical IC, ion chromatography, chromatogram of anions. And you can see the seven anions listed in the chart. And the concentration of these anions range from one part per million to 20 part per million. And you can also perform a similar analysis for cations. So you can see the strength that these instruments have. HPLC is similar. It works the same way. However, it works well at quantitating organics. So, for example, if you wanted to quantitate the amount of soil that remains or passes through the permeate or even the cleaner residue, you can do that down to several parts per million. The remaining methods, conductivity, hardness, pH, and total dissolved solids, are also viable methods to measure permeate quality. The benefit is they work very quickly. However, their drawback is they don't identify exactly what is in the permeate. The conductivity, the hardness, and the total dissolved solids will give you a total amount of metals that are dissolved, but they won't distinguish between the two. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about matching soils to cleaners. And if you see the chart, you'll see a few different industries listed with the primary phalanx and the secondary phalanx that are common to that industry. And again, a general cleaner type that can be used to clean those membranes. And what I want to talk about specifically is the metalworking industry. This industry typically uses chemicals called coolants. And these chemicals are used to actually shape and form metal parts. So they contain literally a soup of different ingredients. Most of them are oil-based, either petroleum or synthetic. And they contain EP additives, extreme pressure, that actually help form the metal parts. They also contain rust inhibitors antioxidants, and emulsifiers. These uh, coolants are designed to be used between maybe a half to 5% in water, so that's why you need the emulsifiers. And since water now enters the equation, these coolants also need preservatives. So you can see the challenge when this coolant enters the, uh, the membranes. Each ingredient presents a unique cleaning challenge. So where do you start? You know you may need either, say, an alkaline or an acid cleaner. Well, you could try one cleaner. If it works well, maybe try it again, trial and error. Or an alternate choice is to run a small lab-controlled pilot plant study. And this slide shows a few of the parameters that can be used to set up in this pilot plant study. So, for example, a specific type of equipment that has proven to be very useful is a cross-flow filtration unit. And this unit accommodates many different types of membranes. And all the parameters listed on this slide apply to the charts that you'll see in the following slides. We've run different experiments using a polyether sulfone, sulfone UF 5000 molecular cutoff weight membrane. The coolant we, or the, the phalanx we used was an emulsified coolant. We ran different tests. We ran tests using different qualities of water, reverse osmosis, which is very high purity water, and hard water that was synthetic that was made. We ran 2% cleaner concentrations at room temperature, 
And again, the baseline flux, the standard rinse cycle, and the standard failing and cleaning cycles were all kept the same. So this is a photo of what a typical membrane filtration unit looks like. And also there's a schematic in the bottom right diagram. But essentially there's a feed tank. And in the feed tank you put in the water or the cleaning solution or the phalan. It's pumped through the membrane unit. The uh, filtrate is collected in one container and the concentrate feeds back into the feed tank and it just cycles through. So with this, in, with this uh, lab experiment, the following charts can be created. This is a cleaning profile and it compares two different cleaners. But basically, once the membrane is put into the system, it has a break-in period. And when a constant flux is achieved, that's given the baseline of 100%. And then afterwards, the phalan is added. So we add the cooling. And as expected, as it hits the membrane, the flux drops. And in this case, they drop to about 20% of the original baseline. And then the unit was introduced with various stages of rinses, three in this case. And as you can see, the baseline leveled out somewhere around 35 to 40 percent. And then when we achieve that relatively stable baseline, we introduce the cleaner. Now what's interesting, after the cleaner was introduced, the, the flux dropped again. And what started to happen, our theory is that the functional group started to penetrate the salt bridges of the uh, membrane. And then only during the rinsing was both the cleaner solution and the phalanx rinsed away. So as you can see, the blue cleaner did much better because at the end, the flux actually was greater than 100%. So the baseline was better than starting out. The red cleaner achieved an 80% flux recovery, which is okay considering after fouling, it was lower than 20%. But certainly if you can compare the two, you're going to select the blue cleaner instead of the red cleaner. Now the next step is the concentration of the blue cleaner was varied. So these three data points actually represent um, a break-in period, a cleaning, I'm sorry, a fouling, a rinse, a cleaning, and then another rinse. And then the final outcome is the flux recovery, which you see here. So a 1% solution achieved about an 85% flux recovery, a 2% achieved about 100, and then a 3% slightly below 100. So the interesting thing that can be done with this data is you can fit it to a curve. And these points represent a quadratic equation. So now we can figure out what the optimal concentration of cleaner that works in this system. And in this case, the, uh, the Micro 90 cleaning solution, which, which was used in this case, theoretically can provide a 2.4%. If it's used at 2.4%, that's the optimal concentration. So if you know this knowledge going into your, uh, your cleaning protocol, it's much more focused as opposed to just trying a concentration and then the next time trying another concentration. Here's another data that, that is also generated using the lab unit. These three columns show the, uh, the effect that the individual ingredients, the keelant and the surfactants have on cleaning the phalanx. So as you can see, the keelant actually achieved about a 60% flux recovery just by itself. Then after that, the surfactants were introduced, again, just by themselves, and it did a little bit, they did a little bit better they achieved about a 70% recovery. But look what happened when the keelant and the surfactants were combined into a product, into one cleaning product. The flux recovery jumped all the way up to about 90%. So as you can see, there's definitely synergy when you combine these ingredients. So the conclusion is the formulated cleaner has better results than its individual components. Another chart that we think is pretty informative is this one. It shows the flux recovery of four different cleaners, a formulated alkaline, acid, an enzyme, and an alkaline cleaner with a biodegradable cleaner, with a bio, biodegradable keelant. Also, it shows 
the results using RO water and also hard water. So what's interesting is if we use a very high quality of water, it seems like an acid cleaner works best. You can get a recovery. In this instance, we achieved over 100%. However, if the water also contains 200 ppm of metals, it seems like the best cleaner of choice would be either the alkaline cleaner or the alkaline cleaner with the biodegradable keeling. So again, the water quality can affect which cleaner you use. And the enzyme cleaner obviously was a poor match. So that's something that if you ran by itself, yes, it could help. It can give you fluxes and recoveries between 75 to 80 percent, but certainly in comparison, it's a poor match to this specific soil. But that's not to say that enzyme cleaners are, are not effective cleaners. Suppose we change the soil. If you look at the first three columns, the soil was changed to, uh, believe it or not, it's a standard soil that that's, uh, has the nickname blood and guts. And essentially it's a, um, it's a mixture of sheep's blood and some biological proteins that are all mixed together. And believe it or not, this makes a heck of a phalanx to a membrane. And then after the membrane is failed, look how effective an enzyme cleaner is for that specific soil. And then to the right is another, another um, set of uh, columns that compare, or bar charts that compare um, when only hard water is used as the phalanx. It's probably not that realistic because there were no organics or soils introduced. It was si simply 600 ppns of iron as well as calcium and magnesium. And again, if this was the only soil present, then you would conclude that the acid cleaner is the optimal choice. So again, it's imperative that you match your cleaner to your soil. And then finally, the last technical graph that I, that I want to talk about is the, uh, the influence that cleaners in series have. So if you look at the first two bar charts, you see acid one and alkaline two. What that means is an acid cleaner was initially used to clean the membrane, and then it was rinsed, and then an alkaline cleaner was used. So immediately after the alkaline cleaner, the flux recovery was 95%, which is pretty good. Interestingly enough, though, when an alkaline cleaner immediately followed, the performance actually decreased. And this was in RO water. So then if we switch the series, if we hit the membrane after fouling it with an alkaline cleaner and then followed it with an acid cleaner, the results are much more better. And again, we saw similar results with hard water. We didn't really see the same trend with the acid cleaner first and the alkaline cleaner second. However, those results are fairly low and certainly not impressive. But what's interesting, in the hard water, when the alkaline cleaner went first, followed by the acid cleaner, the results were almost equal to that of the similar scenario in the RO water. So again, we conclude that the water quality affects the flux. And in this particular situation, the alkaline cleaner followed by the acid was best for this trial. So what's next for this type of um, experiment? We're going to figure out what the optimal concentrations are of both the alkaline and the acid cleaners to see if we can bump up those recoveries a little bit more. Okay, I'd like to conclude the, the technical part of the webinar with a case study. There was a customer that had been using an alkaline cleaner for a very long time. They used it to treat bilge water, and it was done on ships, and they decided that they would switch to de, a delimining-based cleaner. Now, delimining is a solvent, and it's actually derived from lemon and orange peels. The, the, the lemon and orange peels are squeezed and out comes the solvent. So, as you can imagine, it has a pleasant fragrance. It also has a great solvency for oil. It breaks it down very quickly and it separates very easily from water. So, the account immediately saw better flux results and they found that it worked a lot faster. And then they had the added benefit that delimining was not petroleum-based, and it had a fairly green profile because of its source. 
So it was decided to run a lab test. And again, we kept all the factors the same except for the two that you see here. We substituted a polyacrylonitrile membrane that has 100,000 molecular weight cutoff because that closely mimicked what they used on the ships. And then we compared the original alkaline cleaner with essentially the same alkaline cleaner that contained D-limonene. So here are the results. The original alkaline cleaner, or the control sample, is listed on the left. As you can see, after the membrane break-in period, 100% flux was attained fairly regularly. If you look at the actual flux values at the bottom, on the bottom left graph, you can see it did vary somewhat. Sometimes the flux would be 600, mostly around 800, and every now and then sometimes a little bit higher. So there was variability. With the same alkaline cleaner, however, including d after the initial break-in period, the results were more consistent. They were around 100%. They didn't see that much variability. But then after a while, there was a change. And we didn't know if this change was good or bad. We knew that the flux increased dramatically. So we thought, well, maybe there is something to a d based cleaner. So when the membrane was pulled out, we sent it, it was sent to an independent laboratory and it went a microscopic evaluation. And as you can see, there remained organic and iron oxide particles on the membrane, which is typical. But if you notice the ridge, the white line appearing from the top middle of the picture down to the bottom left, it's actually a small ridge or crack. And that developed with the repeated use of the d based cleaner. So we concluded that the introduction of delimonene is not compatible with this type of application. So the benefit was it's better that this problem occurred using um, a one square foot membrane in a lab trial than if it were done on site in real time. Okay, this concludes the technical part of the webinar. I'd like to hand it over again to Michelle for the conclusions. Well, in conclusion, we know that formulated cleaners offer many benefits. Uh, they're custom formulated, they're performance tested, they're compatibility tested, they offer consistency, as well as quality insurance and long-term performance. And dealing with specialty manufacturers has their benefits as well. The technical know-how, their performance and compatibility, compatibility testing, and they can share knowledge to keep experience in-house. Now, before we address your questions, I just wanted to let you know that we will be sending you a chart that outlines the soils, the filters, and the recommended cleaner types. That will be included in our contact information. And if you have any additional questions or you need samples, please feel free to contact us. All right. Well, now we'll wrap up the webinar with the, with the questions. We've gotten requests for copies of the slides. We'll go ahead and, and include the slides with the membrane cleaning chart, as well as the answers, all the answers to the Q and A's in the, in the questions and answers. Okay. I have a question here from Joe. I'll go ahead and read the question, and Tom will follow up with the with the answer. We were told chelin should not be used in our wastewater treatment plant, but it sounds like we could benefit from them. Should we try them? Thanks, Michelle. Well, th there's a few reasons why chelins should not be used. First of all, the metal chelin recovery strategies would need to be used to remove them after cleaning. So you need to make sure that you can use these techniques, these recovery techniques. Also, most chelins by themselves have very high pHs, so you need to watch compatibility with, with the membranes that you're currently using. But when chelins are, are part of a formulated cleaner, the final pH of that cleaner can be adjusted to a safer level so that the chelin will not have a compatibility issue and it will still be effective. Um, also, some chelins will actually destroy enzymes. So if you, if you are using an enzyme cleaner and you add a keelant to it, or if you first use a keelant, then use an enzyme cleaner without a rinse, the enzymes could become deactivated. 
And enzymes are by far the most expensive raw material in an enzyme cleaner. So I would probably go back to the membrane manufacturer and say, what specifically is the problem with, with using a keelant? And then, um, then perhaps you, you might be able to uh, decide, well, maybe we can try one based on um, what their concerns are. All right, thanks, Tom. Okay, the next question is from Philip, and he asks, you don't discuss the use of phosphate cleaners, but they work great in our system. Do you have any comments? Phosphate cleaners are very effective cleaners. They, they have a, a lot of benefits. They're, they're excellent detergents. They provide chelation. They also protect against corrosion by forming a barrier coating metals, and it prevents uh, subsequent scale formation. But the big drawback is their effect on the environment. And if they're released to groundwater, phosphates act as nutrients and, call, and uh, cause eutrophication, which is when excessive nutrients enter a water source and it causes rapid plant growth like algae. And then the algae depletes all the oxygen in the water, so nothing else can live there. So w what's happening now in a lot of retail cleaners is uh, specifically laundry detergents. Phosphates are either banned or their use is limited significantly. And, and this has already happened in Europe. And also some companies are voluntarily um, banning the use of phosphates. So for this reason, we, we don't really include them because we see them as becoming less and less popular. All right. Okay, the next question is from Maria. We have always cleaned first with an alkaline cleaner and then followed with an acid cleaner. Do you think it's worth reversing them as a test? I, it's definitely worth a lab test using the, your specific soil or, or phalanx that, that you, you routinely deal with. Uh, the, the benefit of first using an alkaline cleaner is that it causes certain membrane polymers to swell slightly, and then that allows the acid cleaner to penetrate the surface area of the membrane, and it can more effectively remove the metals. If your phalanx, though, is, is an emulsion with a very high oil content, first adding an acid could actually split that emulsion, and the oil portion of the emulsion will float to the surface, and, and that oil could further foul the membrane. So actually some accounts use this oil split technique as a pretreatment process. So in this case, I, I would certainly try it in, in the lab um, before you use a plant trial. But basically the theory is, is that the alkaline cleaner will cause the membrane polymer to, to swell, and then the acid cleaner can get in that surface area more effectively and, and continue with a, uh, uh, a better cleaning. All right, and then we have, uh, we have, we have a lot of questions. Um, the webinar has actually gone over the 30 minutes. I still want to encourage you to send in your questions. We will answer them, and we will respond to everyone with all of the Q&A. So I have one more final question. Uh, this is from Bill. Is connectivity enough of a check for, a permeate, for the permeate? There's nothing wrong with using conductivity um, to check for the permeate quality. Uh, the, 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 I guess the big drawback is you won't know specifically what's contributing to the conductivity. If you know that, that heavy metals are not part of your, your phalanx system, then, um, then using conductivity alone would be fine. Um, conductivity does correlate to the overall ion concentration and not specific anions. So um, again, it does have its limitations. But its benefits are that, that they are, it's very quick, it's accurate, and it works down to very low concentrations. All right. Well, that concludes our webinar. That concludes our Q&A portion. Again, we do have other questions. We're going to go ahead and answer those questions, and we will send everyone a document with all of the information, including the presentation slides, the filter membrane chart, as well as the Q&A. I thank you again, and please feel free to contact us if you need any cleaner samples or if you have any questions. Thank you again.